So when when the term black metal first started getting floated around, it was more of an ideology. It referred to a certain kind of extremely satanic band, and there were vague sonic similarities between some somebody like Merciful Fate or Hellhammer or Bathory and of course Venom that were all labeled black metal at one time or another. I mean, even even Slayer at, at some point got referred to as, as black metal. Right. But, you know, musically, there wasn't a lot that those bands had in common. And then with the second wave, black metal really referred to a certain sound that bands like Mayhem and Dark Throne were trying to, trying to propagate. And, you know, like I said before, it was, it was kind of a reaction to what was happening in death metal at the time. But those bands weren't necessarily satanic. I think, you know, almost immediately you started seeing this kind of reach into Viking folklore and nature and certain political ideologies and things like that. And second wave black metal was really more of a sound than it was a philosophy. In your opinion, what what unites the bands that are considered U.S. black metal? Is it an ideology? Is it a sound? Or is it both? Yeah, it's definitely not an ideology. And while I I feel like I'm constantly quoting Paul Ledney of Pro Fanatica uh, because he was very specific when we talked. Uh, Paul Ledney, his point of view is that U.S. black metal is a particular sound. It is a dirty, satanic form of death metal. And, you know, the, the bands who play that sound, so Pro Fanatica and, I guess, Black Witchery and, you know, other bands that, that stayed ugly and kind of that, what some people have started to call war metal at this point, Paul Edney is convinced that that is what USBM is. And that's fine. That's, I, I, I can completely understand that perspective. It's where... U.S. black metal comes from, certainly. But man, there's, I also don't think there's a sound. Like, like this book, USBM, it's a geographical focus. In fact, even the sections of the book are mostly geographically based. But it is not focused on a sound. This idea that you can, and, and this is what I love about this kind of music. You can take blast beats that, that, the blur together you can take tremolo picking or really evil riffing you can take high-pitched screeches and and you can do like you can travel so many different places by reorganizing what those instruments are doing in combination with maybe other instrumental choices or certain songwriting choices that man there are all kinds of different sounds that can come out of this and that's that's what I guess, that's what I enjoy about it. I, you know, when I talked about my musical listening history, it's pretty eclectic. It's pretty all over the place. And I, I like that black metal can do some of that. It can travel all these different places. And still, there, there can be elements of black metal that, that draw me back to that feeling. I, I don't know that I'm answering your question very well, but but I, I don't want to simplify the bands in this book down to a particular sound. Black metal is such a nebulous term. It almost becomes like punk rock where, right. you know, any number of, of characteristics can identify a band as black metal. You know, I, I remember, you know, there's a point where U.S. black metal was something like Atron, who really sounded more like Deicide you know yes side with like yes keyboards and that was that was kind of what u.s black metal was in the 90s you know these these death metal bands that really hewed to an, a, an earlier style and i guess maybe a less refined style of death metal with maybe a lot of thrash influences and maybe some you know some satanic overtones or maybe some sketchy politics and that's kind of what <laughs> what yeah. U.S. black metal was. And then, you know, it, it was only maybe in the early 2000s that you started getting this more second wave kind of style where it was, you know, the the trebly tremolo riffing and the, the constant blast beats and stuff like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, agreed. So, I mean, in terms of like what makes a U.S. band a black metal band, it, it, it's, it almost becomes like, well, it, it's up to the listener to decide. Uh, I'm guessing Paul Ledney would not own a pink Death Heaven shirt, right? <laughs> no, not not even close, man. <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of people really gravitated more towards the the anti-religious and, and satanic aspects of black metal more than the sound. And so any number of bands that that kind of filled that niche would, would be black metal to some people and not necessarily the guys writing about whatever it is, urban living or you know, existential despair or, or whatever. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and, and you're right when you talk about, you know, black metal at different stages was about different things and, and black metal to different people is about different things. I can certainly imagine a, an alternate version of this book uh, written by somebody else who was much more interested in maybe the kind of almost anthropological, like political and and sociological underpinnings of this stuff that is much more about background and historical context, that kind of thing. I'm a voracious music listener. When What draws me to music is the ability for music to take me somewhere, somewhere else, somewhere I'm not physically, maybe somewhere I've never been before. Music can create kind of mental images for me and the the more jarring and strange and outlandish those images kind of the happier I am so you know this book with me as its author was always going to focus on music the way like the way the music can be heard and what elements are in the musical performances on record rather than you know what what kind of ideology you know this person has about about what black metal should be or 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 anything like that now the full title is a revolution of identity what exactly was a revolution well <laughs> i i set out with this book to to prove that maybe the the, the revolution was happening the entire time slowly and under the radar that black metal didn't just have to be the Norwegian sound or, or whatever that, that just by refusing to, to give up by refusing to uh, give in to the idea that playing black metal in the U S was futile, that that itself is revolutionary. Also, I was looking for, kind of, uh, what's the word, uh, evocative words that would tie this book to uh, both the idea of the book, but also the, the geographic location of uh, the United States. And I guess revolution is a, a, a foundational concept in the United States, something that a, a lot of U.S. citizens, like I say, see as, as a foundational point for the country. So saying that and, and, and using that word in connection with identity, which I think is such an important thing for American bands to have claimed for themselves an identity that is not just, you know, the, the, the little brothers of uh, the, the, you know, the kid, the kid brothers and sisters of, of the uh, European scene. Can, can you identify a U.S. black metal band separately from, let's say, a Norwegian black metal band? I mean, you know, when we talk about certain the, certainly the the basic characteristics of something like Dark Throne and something like Wolves in the Throne Room are, are very similar, but is there an approach or a sound that makes U.S. black metal distinct from black metal that uh, comes from other parts of the world? I, I think... In a large part, yes. You know, one of the things that I think is true about European metal is that it's very happy to take on the the rock and roll ethic, that that mantle of like larger than life, big beats, you know, guitar solos. And I'm not necessarily talking about black metal, although that stuff does happen in in 
European black metal too. There's a there's a rock ethic there, and it's it's bombastic, and in some cases it's confrontational, but it's often confrontational in an outward way. That exists in the United States. Usurper, I think, is a good example of a band that is bombastic and rocks, and it's confrontational outwardly. But generally speaking, I feel like a lot of the U.S. bands are way more interested in tunneling inward, using ugly music, using confrontational music to confront something internally. And that's, to me, a lot darker, a lot uh, maybe scarier to turn it inward and, and dig out what's inside of you rather than, you know, consider it a war on the world. Um, so I, I do think that shows up, that, that feeling shows up in a lot of U.S. black metal and, and not as much in European metal. I also think there's a, the preponderance of one-man bands that come from the U.S. scene is, is telling. And I, I don't think it's a coincidence that the U.S. black metal scene really exploded once recording technology got cheap and available to the point where one guy like Jeff Rest or Zassler or you know whoever you know could sit in his 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 basement and record an album entirely by himself and i think for the most part at least the, the norwegian and swedish scenes you know bands were really just bands like maybe there was a figurehead like somebody like John Notfight from Dissection or Euronymous, but these really were bands that were writing albums together. And I think there's a kind of iconoclasm and maybe, you know, I, I, I don't know what the word is, but I, I think living outside of the United States, I, I can say that there is a perception of Americans as somebody who are not afraid to express their opinions. <laughs> yeah. Even if they have... Even if they have no knowledge of what they're expressing. Do you know what I mean? Oh, man. It's like that's what it means to be a U.S. citizen. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that kind of feeds into this idea that Americans, it's like, well, I'm right and I'm going to do it my way. And <laughs> that's all there is to it. And I think you really see that in the American approach to black metal where it's like, well, I'm going to play the drums and I'm going to play the guitars and I'm going to do the vocals and that's all I really need. As opposed to, you know, this kind of collectivist version of of black metal which you have in in Scandinavia. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I talked to several guys and and that was their absolutely their their perspective is I'm I'm going to pull this off. Mostly it was because they were really interested in this niche music and they looked to their musician friends to be like, Hey, don't you love this too? Will you play this with me? And all their musician friends were like, no, no, absolutely not. <laughs> you know, so, so you get people like Mike Ford from black funeral who tries to cobble together bands from people who don't really enjoy the same music that he does. You get uh, Neil Jameson from Krieg doing some of the same thing. Chris Grigg from Woe just over and over in our interview stating that like he got to a place where he wanted to do something with music and he was like, well, whatever. I'm not, I'm not waiting for somebody else. I'm doing it myself. So yeah, you're absolutely right. That does crop up quite a bit. 